Hello, this is Dr. Claire, and this is our lecture on animal behavior. Um, so behavior is basically what an animal does, right? And so you can look at an animal and see what it's doing, and you can explain its behaviors in uh, two major ways. You can look for what's called a proximate cause of the behavior. A proximate cause is how that behavior functions. So those can be uh, physiological mechanisms that underlie the behavior, like uh, hormones, or sensory stimuli or neurological pathways, something that's within the body that dictates the way the behavior occurs. Um, or it could also be um, a pro another pro type of proximate cause would be the development of the behavior. So how is it that that behavior develops as the animal matures? Um, so those are both proximate causes. Or you can look at it from another direction, look at the ultimate cause. So the ultimate cause is why does the behavior occur? So what is the adaptive function behavior? How does that improve the animal's fitness? Um, or what is the evolutionary history of that animal? And is there something in, the, uh, in its lineage that dictates that the behavior is that way. So if we look at this bird here, this is a frigate bird. Um, it is doing a mating display. So it is watching for females to fly over. And when they do, it rattles its bill and inflates its big balloon and kind of in its throat and does this kind of thing where it just goes, oh, look at my beautiful red throat. Um, so the proximate cause for that behavior may be because the male frigate bird's testosterone is high or because um, during development, he learned to do this behavior from his father. Um, so those would be proximate causes for the behavior of this figure bird. The ultimate cause of the behavior would be an, either an adaptive reason, such as this helps him get mates and so it increases his fitness, or something like uh, his in the ancestors of this frigate bird did this behavior and inherited this behavior from the ancestors but it no longer serves a functional purpose. That could be another ultimate cause. Okay, so those are the, the whenever you're th looking at a behavior, if you want to explain that behavior, you can either explain it with a proximate cause or an ultimate cause or both. Okay, so let's take a look at some um, proximate causes. So uh, one of the big questions in behavior has historically been, is this behavior something that is uh, dictated by genes or is it something that comes from the animal's environment? This, this debate is kind of, has been framed as it nature versus nurture. So um, the nature argument would say that behavior is dictated by genes in the genome and the nurture uh, argument would say that it's dictated by some sort of environmental exposure in the development of the organism. Um, these two things are not mutually exclusive and most behaviors are actually a combination of both nature and nurture. Um, so it's kind of a false dichotomy. Um, but let's take a look at some behaviors that are genetically determined. Um, so some, some behaviors do have very strong genetic determination. So for example, um, this uh, maternal behavior in mice uh, can be influenced by a single gene, the FOSB gene. And a mouse with a normal FOSB gene will ex uh, exhibit normal maternal behavior. Uh, basically, the mother mouse will crouch over her offspring and keep them warm. And if they're separated from her, um, the, my, the baby mice will squeak and the mother will gather them all up in a pile and then sit on them again. That's normal mouse mom behavior. Um, individual mice who have, do not have a functional FOSB gene, they have a mutation and their FOSB gene is not functional, they don't exhibit those behaviors. So they won't gather up their babies if they get separated and they don't spend as much time sitting on them and keeping them warm. So that maternal behavior is actually regulated by this one single gene. A lot of times behaviors are regulated by the hormones that are circulating in the, uh, the system of the animal, and these hormones can actually be influenced by the environment. So in this example, um, there's a group of anole lizards, um, and uh, if you have a group that's all females, um, generally uh, during the reproductive season, about 80% uh, of those females will be in reproductive condition, just on their own. Um, if you add one male to the group, then um, that male will court the females and that courtship will actually trigger the onset of the hormones that are necessary for reproduction. And so with a single male in the group, all of the females become reproductively active. But if you put multiple males in the group, then those males will fight with each other rather than courting females. So the females aren't getting that courtship stimulus. On top of that, all of that fighting increases stress hormones, and stress hormones tend to suppress reproductive hormones. So you actually see a decrease in the number of reproductively capable females where only 40% of them are, are reproductive. <clears throat> Um, so if you're looking at behaviors, you can kind of d divide behaviors in addition to um, behaviors that are 
controlled by different things. You can look at how they develop. So some behaviors are innate. So um, an innate behavior is one that is instinctive. It does not require learning. Um, they tend to have fix, what are called fixed action patterns. Um, so for example, a goose, upon seeing a object that looks like an egg, a, a nesting goose, will do this movement with her neck where she stretches out her neck with her and puts her bill behind the egg and rolls the egg into the nest. Um, so she sees the egg, she rolls the egg. The, the, the image of the egg is what we call a releaser. It releases that behavior. Um, and every time a nesting goose sees something egg-shaped, she goes through this behavior where she stretches her neck and rolls the egg. You can take away the egg in the middle of the behavior. She'll still complete the roll. You can give her a baseball. She will roll the baseball. You can give her a soccer ball. She will roll the soccer ball. If it is remotely round and white, she's going to do the behavior. And so anything will actually, anything that's remotely egg-like will release this behavior in, in any goose. It's not something that's learned. It's completely innate. Okay? Um, but a lot of other behaviors are learned. Um, so a behavior can be learned if, if there's an association between that particular behavior and some sort of uh, result. Um, this is what we call associative learning. Um, and so those can be either uh, positive or negative responses. So for example, this dog here uh, has learned to balance a biscuit on its nose. It's learned through previous experience that if it, it sits there and holds still and lets the biscuit sit on its nose until it is released by the human, that it will be rewarded by being allowed to eat the biscuit. And if it doesn't hold still, the human will take away the biscuit. So it's a positive association. If I sit still, I get the biscuit. So that's, that's a positive association. Um, on the bottom, we have a toad who attempts to eat a bee, gets stung, and in the future has learned not to eat bees because it has a negative association between the behavior of eating the bee and that negative experience of being stung. So that'd be a negative association. Um, there's also non-associative learning where there's no association between the behavior and a particular response. Um, so one great example of that is migration. Um, many birds need to learn their migratory route, but there's no like big party or food item at the end of the migration. They just learn the migration and then they will repeat that migration over and over again. So it's not associated with a particular response. Um, this particular image here is from the whooping crane migration. Whooping cranes are a endangered crane, uh, big wading bird. Um, and they are reared by hand, uh, this is part of their recovery program, but um, they have to learn their migratory route from their parents, so they're reared by humans in crane suits, so that they think that they're a crane, and the human then gets into an ultralight plane, the human in the crane suit gets into an ultralight plane and teaches the young how to fly, and then flies them on their migratory route from North Dakota down to Texas. And so once they've been flown with the plane once, then from then on they'll remember and they'll go back and forth along that same route. Um, so that, that example with the cranes is, leads very nicely into this next example, uh, which is that a lot of times the development of behavior is dependent on the parents. So many species of animals will imprint on a uh, a living thing that they see early in their life and form a social attachment to that and that other living thing is what um, teaches them uh, how to be the animal that they are. So most of the time they're going to imprint upon their parents. So you have ducklings that imprint upon a mother duck, the mother duck swims around with the ducklings, the mother duck eats and shows the babies what to eat and they learn how to be a duck from watching that other duck. But sometimes um, animals can imprint incorrectly. For example, these ducklings have imprinted on a corgi. They will probably grow up thinking they are corgis. They may have mate preferences for corgis. Obviously that is not going to be very, uh, they're not going to have very high fitness if they want to mate with corgis rather than the other ducks. So it's generally good if you imprint on the same species that you are. Um, and that social interaction with uh, a member of the same species is really important for proper behavioral development. Um, so for example, in monkeys, um, they've, in the 50s, they did a bunch of really kind of cruel experiments with monkeys where they separated them from their parents and then gave them a choice of uh, fake mothers to associate with. And so they gave them a choice between a wire mother who had milk or a fur-covered mother uh, who did not have milk. 
and they would actually prefer to associate with the fur-covered mother, and they would only go over to the wire mother when they were hungry. So they were looking for something that was as much like an actual monkey as possible. Unfortunately, these baby monkeys did not fare very well. Um, they never learned how to socialize and be monkeys, and so when they grew up, they were not able to be with other monkeys, and they tended to uh, display all kinds of behaviors like self-harm and um, repetitive behaviors that are really not normal for monkeys. So it not, wasn't a very ethical study at the time. Um, another really important behavior or effective behavior is communication between individuals. So various individuals need to be able to communicate with each other and influence each other's behavior in a lot of times. So when you're looking at communication, you have you always have a sender who is sending a signal. You have a receiver who is um, receiving that signal, and then that signal should elicit some kind of response in the receiver. So for example, here we have a bull elk who is bugling. Um, the receiver would be cow elk that he's trying to attract, and hopefully the response to his signal would be that the cow elk would come hang out with him and hopefully mate with him. So that would be an example of a, of a, a sender-receiver response kind of uh, scenario there. Um, there's a lot of different signals that uh, animals can use for communication. They can use visual sing signals. So for example, our frigate bird from the beginning has that big, beautiful, uh, um, inflatable throat po pocket. Um, that will visually signal females that he's ready to mate. Um, a lot of species use uh, acoustic signals, so sound signals, um, birds and frogs. Um, but there's some other more interesting signals. For example, these are uh, this is a group of electric fishes that actually can send an electric signal to each other and they can communicate their intentions that way. Um, termites uh, use chemical signals. So the queen will communicate with the workers using uh, chemicals that she produces. That big thing in the middle there is the queen. Um, and it, the, the queens can actually suppress workers from becoming reproductive. If there's too many queens in the colony, they can send out a signal that will keep other individuals from becoming queens. Um, and then uh, other animals can signal uh, mechanically. Um, so these uh, spiders here can send signals to each other by jiggling their webs, and they can detect those web vibrations and communicate that way. So there's a lot of different ways that animals can communicate with each other and um, uh, let their intentions be known to other individuals. Uh, one more behavior that I do want to talk about is uh, altruism. So the altruism uh, is when one animal engages in a behavior that uh, is apparently costly to the animal who's engaging in it, and it's beneficial to another individual. Um, and so this was a real puzzle in evolutionary biology for a long time because that uh, altruistic behavior um, can have a fitness cost to the individual that does it. Um, so the question then becomes, why would individuals engage in this altruistic behavior if it's costly to do? Um, the, one of the first ideas was that it, it's what we would call group selection. So it's they engage in it for the good of the species. Um, but this doesn't actually work be, uh, in evolutionary theory because if you think about it, if you have a group of animals and some individuals you do the altruistic behavior, it benefits everybody in the group. Um, and other individuals don't do the altruistic behavior. There's basically cheaters in the group. The cheaters are going to have higher fitness than the altruists. And so because they have higher fitness, that genotype, the cheater genotype, is going to become more common because they have higher reproductive success. And so you're going to see that the, um, the cheaters are going to outcompete the altruists, even if it's something that's beneficial to the, um, to the whole group. So the, the altruistic genes will be selected again. So the group selection doesn't explain why these things persist. So what does explain why these things persist? Well, in some cases, um, the altruistic behavior occurs because they are helping kin. Um, so basically, when if you help a relative uh, that, and that relative then survives and reproduces, you share some genes with that relative, presumably, possibly also the altruistic gene, whatever your altruistic gene is. Um, and so by helping your relative, you're actually passing on more of your genes than you would otherwise. That's what we call inclusive fitness. So your genes are passed on through the reproduction of a relative rather than your own reproduction. Um, one classic example of this is in wild turkeys. So these are two male wild turkeys displaying. Um, turkeys who display in pairs 
get many more females than turkeys who display alone, but only one male in the pair, the dominant male in the pair, gets to mate. The, the subordinate male in the pair doesn't get to have any babies at all. Only the dominant male gets to have babies. So the subordinate male is giving up. If he went off and reproduced by himself, he would be able to have some babies. So he's giving up the babies that he would be ha able to have by himself to help the other individual. Turns out that these are almost always brother-brother pairs or father-son pairs. And so the offspring that the brother or the father has um, is enough to offset the cost of giving up their own reproduction. So that's an example of kin selection. Um, another example of how these altruistic be behaviors can arise is if they actually do have a benefit to the individual. So it doesn't look like they're getting a benefit at the time, but there actually is some sort of benefit, and so it, it can actually be selfish. Um, so this pi this uh, um, picture here below with these little blue birds, these, these are um, red-capped mannequins. Um, their mating display involves uh, several males doing this beautiful dance where they hop over each other to impress a female. A female will never mate with a single male. She will only mate with the dominant male of a dance troupe. So um, all of the other males in the dance troupe, though, don't get to mate with the females. Only the dominant male does. So why would you be a backup dancer if you never get to mate with the female? Well, the only way that you get to be the lead dancer in a dance troupe is if you work your way up the ranks and become the lead dancer. So if you're off by yourself, you're never going to get to mate with a female. But if you cooperate and you're a part of a dance troupe as a backup dancer for a little while, eventually you maybe get to become the lead dancer in the troupe, and then you'll mate with females. Okay. Uh, one more way that altruism can arise is if you have what's called reciprocal altruism. And that's basically if you do a favor for an individual one day, and then another day that individual returns the favor. Okay. Um, so a classic example here is uh, in vampire bats. Vampire bats fly out at night. They try and find a large mammal like a cow. They bite it and they drink its blood. If you're a vampire bat, you either find a cow and you get a nice big blood meal, or you don't find a cow and you're starving. And so they come back to the roost and the, the bats that found a cow um, are full. The bats that didn't find a cow are hungry and the hungry bats will beg from the full bats who will then regurgitate some blood for the hungry bat. Um, it doesn't cost the, the full bat very much because they got so much blood that they're, they're feeling pretty good. They can share a little bit of blood and they'll still be okay. Uh, but it makes a big difference for the hungry bats because they, would, they might be starving by the time the next night comes around. Um, so the only time this would work is if there is a punishment for cheaters. And in fact, that's what happens is the bats remember who they've given blood to before. And if when they go to, if they come home hungry and they go to one of the bats that they've given blood to before and that bat doesn't share with them, they remember that bat and they will ostracize that bat and it'll be kicked out of the colony. So cheaters get punished in this particular scenario. So the fitness of cheaters is actually lower because the group discriminates against them. All right, that's my lecture on animal behavior, and I'll catch you guys next time.